Well, let's go ahead and kick this off. Again, thanks, everyone, for joining us again today. Uh, my name is Justin Chug, and I'm with Insable. And today's discussion is going to focus on creating a disaster recovery checklist. And this is in continuation of the last discussion that we had, which was focused on and partnering with commercial, pro commercial property insurance brokers. And so the purpose of this is to help us finalize and kind of shape, shape the discussion with the commercial property insurance brokers by providing a disaster recovery checklist. And if you have, didn't join us last time, uh, you're welcome to listen in on the recording. But essentially, we were the strategy behind this was to focus on this, this type of insurance, which is known as business interruption insurance. It's actually an addendum that companies can purchase for traditional property insurance. So it's not a standalone insurance, but it's always an addendum. And what this does is it helps provide funds to companies who lose money due to natural disaster. And it really wasn't a coincidence, or I guess it, it, it's an interesting coincidence, I should say, that we, for everything that's happening in Florida um, over the past few days, and my condolences to anybody that has been affected by the storm. But I think that um, it's really interesting that we're seeing such a large increase in natural disasters. Uh, the UN, every 20 years, releases a report which basically outlines the impact that natural, disaster, natural disasters have on um, businesses and the economy. And that report actually came out just on Wednesday, and they found that in the past 20 years, there was a 151% increase in economic cost due to natural disasters compared to the previous 20 years. And so this wasn't just something that they're predicting. This is the actual stats and the impacts. And so kind of like what we talked about last time, the impact of natural disasters is increasing for whatever reason. Um, most likely it's due to climate change. But at the end of the day, business interruption insurance is going to be really important to companies. And so our job as technology consultants is to make sure that their business interruption insurance costs are minimized by implementing a disaster recovery plan. So that's what we're going to talk about today, what that disaster recovery plan should look like and how you can implement that and partner with commercial property insurance brokers in implementing these plans for their clients. Now, most of you should have received an Excel spreadsheet from Katie this week. There should have been two. Um, one was listing all of the zip codes across the U.S., not all of them, but the top 100 that are most affected by natural disasters. Um, basically, what we did is we analyzed the number of severe weather alerts that showed up for each zip code and then listed them from the most frequent to uh, the least frequent in the top 100 across the continental U.S. And so if you didn't get that spreadsheet, let us know. We'll be more than happy to forward that over to you. The second spreadsheet had a list of all of the commercial property insurance brokers, and so this will help you execute what we're talking about today in terms of helping you reach out and form those relationships. So let's go ahead and start in terms of what creating this disaster recovery plan. And there's six core services that we're going to want to focus on in terms of keeping them alive in, 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 in when a natural disaster hits, kind of like what's happening in Florida or what happened in Florida. The first, first of which is phone service. Now, we're going to keep everything kind of high level today, and some of these, some of these natural disaster, disaster recovery lists will look a little bit different depending on which types of verticals that you're focusing on, but these are essentially the core services that we're going to try to keep alive. Now, when Sandy hit New York a few years back, one of the main issues they had was a lot of the phone carriers were, uh, were literally underwater, and this kept them... Um, offline for many times months at a time and so what a lot of companies did is they were able to circumvent their hosted voice providers by having the DID provider move the service basically point the phone numbers to a different provider until they were able to get that back up in line because a lot of these companies really depended on that phone service and so when you're looking at your disaster recovery plan you want to make sure that your DID provider is different from the hosted voice provider and that you have the ability to point those phone numbers somewhere else. Also, it's important that companies have third-party phone apps, something like a WhatsApp, 
would be uh, perfect because although a lot of hosted voice providers have their own uh, apps for phone service, you want to make sure that it's a third party because if the hosted voice provider is down, that phone app is going to be down as well. This phone app will be helpful in terms of communicating what what's going to happen if the phone service is down, what, you know, it, are we going to be working from home? So you need to still be able to communicate internally, and that's a great, um, that's one of the great advantages of using those third-party apps. And obviously you want to make sure that you have the call forwarding in place, and because it is 2018, everyone should be using a cloud-based contact center rather than a premise-based contact center, especially in, in light of what we've been talking about in terms of the increasing number of natural disasters that we're experiencing using a cloud-based contact center really makes sense. Now, in terms of email, um, I think we depend on email more than we do phones these days. And so having a cloud-based email solution is absolutely essential. I don't think a lot of companies are using the premise base, but there are some hybrid solutions out there that depend on both. And so you want to make sure that you have um, a cloud-based email platform that's available to everyone. And even though it is cloud-based, um, there are a lot of email providers that do go down. And so offering a third-party backup email service is essential as well. And so if someone outside of that traditional cloud-based email needs to be providing an ongoing backup of that email service. And you need to have another email provider lined up in case that core service goes down. And you can take that file and basically transfer it over. And so you need to make sure that all that's in place for your clients. Now, when it comes to Internet service, it, it kind of surprises me that a lot of companies use um, terrestrial type internet services as a backup. Oftentimes these are using the same lines as their core service and it's not really a, a very good backup service. And I would say that internet service is more important than their, their actual electricity at the office because you can still use your cell phones and laptops um, using the backup battery. Uh, in case of a, an electric, electrical fail, um, failure. And so when it comes to Internet service, the only true redundant Internet, internet service is going to be satellite. And there's a lot of great options today um, that provide true redundancy, true satellite services, and it's a great insurance policy to have in place. Uh, you also want to make sure that that Internet service via the satellite has a true auto failover, or at least it's running through an SD-WAN connection that simultaneously utilizing that line and has access to that in case the core line service goes down. You also want to make sure that the, the Wi-Fi has a self-healing meshed network. Um, this will help keep things going independent of what's happening. And so, again, if you want redundancy and Internet service is going to be core to that redundancy, you're going to need to use satellite services for that. Now, Everything that we sell in terms of technology is really a means to an end. And the means to, the, to that end is to enable applications to function. And so having access to those applications is truly essential in, in the case of a natural disaster. And so in order to keep those applications alive, oftentimes they're sitting on desktops inside of an office, and you just may not be able to have access to them. And so in order to keep people working, in the case of a natural disaster, there needs to be some type of a virtual image of their of their desktop in the office. And that can get very expensive if you try to replicate virtual desktops for everyone. And so what you do is you just have a few core virtual desktop images in place that can be replicated with the click of a button. And so those images will have the core applications already installed on them, and then you can scale those to a few hundred if you needed to within a few minutes and spin those up and have those available for everyone to work from home. And so that's usually the best solution for implementing um, application redundancy. You can also virtualize the applications and make them available via browsers, kind of like what uh, CRMs do, and giving you access to those via the web. Along the same lines, data um, should also be virtualized. I think we all know this. Um, but <clears throat> there's a lot of different things that we need to take into consideration when it comes to data. Um, there needs to be a virtual image of the backup or at least a hot server that they can swap over. But the main thing here is we need to make sure that it's a unique vendor. Oftentimes we work with data centers who have 20 or 40 locations and that's considered redundancy. 
But even though it's a different location, it's still the same vendor, and it doesn't really create a true redundancy unless it's a different vendor in a different location. And so you always want to make sure that you're using multiple vendors from a backup solution, just like we talked about with email and phone service and everything else. Things, redundancy only comes from different vendors. And so that's something you want to make sure that you can keep, keep in mind and that there's a historical backup because one of, the, one of the areas that's most frequent in terms of disasters is ransomware and corrupted data where you can't have access to the data, but if you were able to go back in time and take a snapshot of that data, that would be essential to that disaster recovery effort. Also, as we talked about in the past, um, a lot of weather prohibits folks from reaching the office or the office may be underwater, or there may be something. And so we have to create a solution that allows people to have access to office space when the core office space is unavailable. And so typically your, your top solution is going, to have, is going to be working from home. And so providing means, kind of like what we talked about with applications, where people can actually work from home, having additional desktops like a stack of laptops or iPads available would be essential to having that um, that third, that outside workspace available to everyone. So what I love about the natural disaster discussion is it creates uh, a really great synergy for your lead exchange. And so this is just a small example, but when you're creating a, natural, a disaster recovery plan for clients, it really is going to have lots of different people that are working together to create a core solution. So there's a really good synergy here and a dependency on everyone else to really create that solution. And so your responsibility here is to really help coordinate this effort and integrate a seamless plan. And so in this, this is just a uh, simple example, but there would be six members here that would be working together to help make this all work. You would have an insurance broker, a CRM provider, a satellite provider, a data backup provider, a contact center provider, and yourself. And basically, everyone here would be working together to create what we just discussed on those six items. And if you haven't had a chance to look at our referral partner trainings or our lead exchange trainings, this is a great opportunity to dive into that and look at how to create uh, a good synergy with your members. But just kind of a high-level review, essentially what you're going to do is you're going to take those six members and look at a, a core list that you wanted to, in terms of prospects, divide the list up and have everyone focus on setting up appointments. And that essentially creates a 6x or 600% increase in appointments rather than trying to set up appointments yourself. Because everyone needs each other in this overall solution, uh, everyone's going to be helping in, work in setting up appointments. And my recommendation would be to focus on a specific vertical. There's 28 uh, industries that are most dependent on technology services. So if you think about uh, the computer game industry, it would be really hard for them to develop computer games without access to the Internet or access to their applications or computers. And so these are the industries that are most dependent on these types of technologies. And so you can select any of those and just start working that list with your lead exchange group. In terms of the strategies, um, there's a few that we've talked about in the past, whether it's volunteerism or setting up appointments via surveys or using news reports or your customers' competitors. Any of these strategies w would work really well when it comes to selling uh, disaster recovery solutions. Um, I would probably recommend the volunteerism. That's probably one of the most effective ways in terms of implementing this, especially in light of everything that's happening just this week. Now, before we wrap up, I just wanted to remind everyone, our next session will have the author of The One Thing, which is one of the greatest business books of all time. Um, but if you haven't had a chance to review his book, I would highly recommend checking that out, making sure that you're familiar with it, which will help the discussion on our, on our, on our next call much more um, effective for you.